We all enjoy the beautiful nature around us. How is it possible? Have you ever thought of what life would be if we could not see, hear, taste, smell or enjoy the loving touch of our dear ones? All these are made possible only through our senses. Our senses are critical to our survival and they help to enhance our quality of life. When we look into the history of sensation and perception, we will be surprised to know that experimental psychology began with the study of sensation and perception. William Wundt, who is considered as the founder of modern psychology, studied vision, hearing, attention and reaction times in his first established psychology lab in 1879. Even though the scientific study of sensation and perception began with the establishment of Wundt's laboratory in 1879. There are evidences that the senses were discussed and studied much earlier in history in places like Egypt, India, Greece and Rome. Sensation is the process that makes our brains to take in information through the main five sense organs which can be analyzed and interpreted by the brain. These specific processes are happening passively and the individual need not be consciously aware of what is happening or in other words what he is sensing. The individual can engage himself in the process without any conscious effort and when this information is properly selected, organized and interpreted, the second process called the perception happens. Perception on the other hand is a way of active arrangement of the information brought into the brain via senses through proper selection, organization and interpretation. The sensation process happens through three main stages, namely reception, transduction and transmission. In the first stage, namely reception, the sensory organs absorb energy from an external physical stimuli from the environment. That is, the sense organs receive the stimuli from the environment. In the second stage, namely transduction, the sensory signal in the sensory system is translated to an electrical signal in the nervous system. The third stage is transmission through neural pathways to the brain. Receptors are specialized cells that detect stimuli. More specifically, they are neurons that convert incoming energy into electrical form through a process called transduction. This energy is sent to the nervous system that is brain and the spinal cord for processing. The processing that helps to interpret the stimuli is called perception. The human brain starts to organize, arrange and interpret the information brought in by the sense organs from the senses in an orderly meaningful pattern. What is this meaningful interpretation? It involves two processes namely selective attention and perceptual expectancy. We will see what is this selective attention. Here the brain analyzes the information and differentiates the content in the information as important one and less important one. This process takes place as a result of the motivation of the individual. 
the drive behind the content area is influenced by individual's motivation. We will see an example. We will consider two teachers. One teacher is inside the class and the other teacher is just passing by the class. The teacher in the class is actually using selective attention. That is, she should monitor each and every student inside the class and her attention is confined inside the class. But this may not be the case of a teacher passing by the classroom. The same attention is not shown by the teacher passing by. She may see the students and the teacher who is inside the class, but she may not pay attention to them. Now we will see what is perceptual expectancy. The past experiences and the past history of an individual are very important as a person perceives the matter or information. For example, a person who belongs to a particular nation has his own culture and beliefs and he perceives things as according to his culture and beliefs but another person may not feel like the same way as the first person does. Sensory processing deals with how the brain processes sensory input from multiple sensory modalities. Sensation occurs through our five sensory systems namely vision, hearing, taste, smell and touch. All these systems are connected to the different parts of the brain. Without sensation, we cannot enjoy the beautiful and attractive things in the nature like the flowers or the songs of the birds. Each sensory system has unique sensory receptors which identifies the specific stimuli from the environment. Once identified, these stimuli are converted into certain electrochemical reactions and the brain reads the neural messages and this allows the brain to experience the stimuli. A stimulus is the pattern of physical energy, example light, pressure, chemicals that is produced by an object or event in the environment. There are two types of stimuli, one is called distal and the other one is proximal. A distal stimulus refers to the energy from the actual object such as the light reflected from a distant tree. The proximal stimulus is defined as the pattern of physical energy on the sensory receptors that results from the distal stimulus such as the pattern of light on the retinal photoreceptors. The different sense organs and the function is being explained now. The organ for the sense of vision is the eye. The eye alone cannot make sight possible. It works with the brain and on the outside need lights to be present. Light is a factor mainly related to vision. When there is no light, we are unable to see. Let us see the important characteristics of light. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation and the visible light forms just a small part of the full spectrum of this radiation. The sun emits radiation over a much larger part of the spectrum than the chunk of it that we can see. Light travels extremely quickly at a rate of about 30 lakhs kilometers per second. In effect, this means that light transmission is instantaneous. So, we cannot determine light transmission by perceiving the differences in arrival time. No biological system exists that could respond quickly enough to signal such tiny time intervals. As light travels so much faster, the equivalent difference in time of arrival we would need to detect would be one millionth of a millisecond. This is impossible for neurons to resolve. Fortunately, the other major property of light that we do not need time of arrival information to know where the light is coming from. In transparent media such as air, 
light rays travel in straight lines enabling it to convey information with high spatial precision this means that two rays of light coming from adjacent leaves on a tree outside the window or adjacent letters on a page fall on different parts of the retina the part of the eye that translates optical image information into neural signals as a result of this simple property of light namely traveling in straight line we can resolve these separate details in other words we have a high degree of directional sensitivity or a high acuity without this property the light from adjacent letters on a page would become irretrievably jumbled and we would not be able to resolve the letters the visual system works on sensing and perceiving light waves let us see how the eye is taken light and gives us the image of the object first let us see what the eye is made up of and then have a closer look at how it works when considering the structure of the eye it mainly consists of three layers the outer layer consists of the sclera and cornea the middle layer consists of the choroid ciliary body and iris the inner layer consists of the retina what is this cornea cornea is a round transparent area that allows light to pass into the eye lens it is a transparent structure that focuses light onto the retina retina is the inner membrane of the eye that receives information about light using rods and cones the functioning of the retina is similar to the spinal cord both act as a highway for information to travel on pupil pupil is the opening at the center of the iris which controls the amount of light entering the eye it dilates and constricts now we'll see what is these rods and cones there are approximately 120 million rods and approximately 6.4 million cones in our human eye rods are the visual receptor cells that are important for night vision and peripheral vision the rods are better for night vision because they are much more sensitive than cones in addition the rods are better for peripheral vision because there are many more on the periphery of the retina the cones are mostly in and around the fovea but decrease as we go out to see best at night we have to look just above or below the object this keeps the image on the rods now we'll see what is this cones cones the visual receptor cells are very important in daylight vision and color vision the cones work well in daylight but not in dim lighting this is why it's more difficult to see colors in low light most cones are located in the center of the retina called the fovea which is a tiny spot in the center of the retina that contains only cones visual acuity is best here we can see many colors but there are only three types of cones that receive information about color we have cones that pick up light waves for red green and blue when light falls onto the object the light is reflected and directed to our eyes the light travels through the pupil and passes through the lens the lens sharpens the image of the object inverts it and displays it on the retina it is inverted because the rays coming through the eyes are refracted and cross each other the retina is a very complex tissue made up of optic nerves called photoreceptors that are special nerves for detecting light the optic nerves are the neurons that take the inverted image from the retina and send it to a special part of the brain the brain interprets it and tells us what the object is and what to do all this happens within millions of a second
This is the next sensory system which takes into account sound. Like light, sound is also a form of physical energy. But this type of energy is mechanical. Sound is caused due to vibration. Sources of sound cause the air molecules next to them to vibrate certain frequencies and these disturbances are transmitted to neighboring molecules. This causes waves of vibration which spread outwards from the source just as waves spread on a calm pond when we throw a pebble into it. In this way, sound can travel around corners unlike light. So, sound brings out a very different form of information than light. Since it is not constrained to travel in straight lines, it can tell us about things that are out of sight but cannot tell us about spatial location with as much precision as light can. As sound travels through the air, the air pressure at a given point will change according to the frequency of the sound. We are sensitive to a range of frequencies from about 30 hertz to about 12 kilohertz. The organ we all know for hearing sound is the ear. Once our ear receives the sound information, our brain start processing and help us understand what we are hearing. Let us now see how the ears aid in sensing the sound. It is also responsible for maintaining our balance. The outer part of the ear comprises of pinna, external auditory meters or canal and tympanic membrane. The pinna is a projecting elastic cartilage covered with skin. It is sensitive as well as effective in collecting sound waves and routes the sound waves in towards the passage leading to the eardrum. The incoming sound waves then set up mechanical vibrations of the tympanic membrane. On the other side of the tympanic membrane is the middle ear which is an air filled chamber containing three interlocking bones called ossicles. These are the smallest bones in the body and function to transmit the vibrations caused by auditory stimulation at the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. It is connected via a system of bones to the oval window of an organ called cochlea. These bones function like a gearbox transforming the amplitude of the vibration to one which is usable by the cochlea. The cochlea contains a membrane stretched along its length. This is the basilar membrane and all parts of it are attached to very delicate elongated cells. These cells are called hair cells. When a given part of the basilar membrane vibrates, a deformation occurs in the group of hair cells that are attached there. This deformation is the stimulus for the production of action potentials in the neuron attached to the hair cell. The neurons are bundled together and become part of the acoustic nerve which transmits information to the auditory cortex and hence we are able to sense sound. The organ for the human sense of touch is the skin. It is the largest sense organ because unlike the others, it is not located at any specific place but the entire body. Our sense of touch uses many different receptors that help us to respond to different stimuli such as pain, pressure, tension, temperature, texture, shape, weight and vibrations. It helps us move away when the brain perceives that there is danger. The different types that is involved in the sense of touch are one is called as thermoreceptors. The receptors that respond to heat and cold are known as thermoreceptors. The next type is nociceptors. It responds to painful stimuli. Then comes mechanoreceptors. 
those respond to mechanical stimuli such as uh, tension, pressure or vibration. Then chemoreceptors are there. Chemoreceptors respond to chemical stimuli such as taste and smell. The entire network of sensory receptors does not only exist in the skin, it is distributed all over the body and even inside the body such as muscle, bones and joints, the heart and blood vessels. Altogether, it is known as the somatosensory system. A few places are there in our body which does not have the sensory receptors. They are our hair and fingernails. That is why we feel no pain when we cut or trim our hair or nails. Our skin contains nerve endings which can detect sources of energy. Higher density of nerve endings are found in some parts of our body such as our fingers and hands. Hence, fingers and hands are used in active exploration of materials around us. We will see an example. Children play games by blindfolding their eyes with a towel and guessing the object by means of touch. The children merely guesses what that object is by means of their touch. They can get a pretty good image of the object through their touch even though they do not see the real object. This example shows that the sense of touch can be used to give a pretty good image of what an object is but it takes some time for the information to build up. Also for the process to work efficiently we need a memory for things that we have experienced before known as tactile memory. The nerve endings that respond to mechanical pressure and which allow for tactile exploration also respond to temperature and also to any substance or events that cause damage to the skin such as burns, cuts, abrasions, fall of corrosive chemicals or electric shock. The sensation of pain associated with such events usually initiates a response of rapid withdrawal from the thing causing the pain. Being able to feel allows us to prevent further harm to us. There are similar nerve endings inside our bodies which enable us to sense various kinds of warning signals from within. For example, the individual purposefully avoids certain situation that causes discomfort to him or her such as stepping back from a burning firecracker or never attempting to play with electricity. Another example is people will have sometimes severe headaches when in odd situation or in the initial stage of a disease. This is a symptom a warning signal given by the body. The organ for taste is the tongue. Taste is referred to as gustation. The entire gustatory system is made up of the tongue, the papillae, taste buds and receptor cells. The surface of the tongue is made up of about 10,000 taste buds found on the papillae. They are the tiny bumps on the tongue. Each taste bud has about 100 receptor cells. Taste buds are the sensory receptors and they are activated when the food reaches the mouth. Five types of taste buds related to soreness, sweetness, saltiness, bitterness and umami which is a taste very similar to monosodium glutamate are present. The receptors for taste that is our taste buds are on the surface of the tongue. When we take food, it enters our mouth and the tongue receives it. Before it moves down to our throat, it is dissolved in saliva and that slips into all the tiny pores and grooves on the tongue. Here, special nerve fibers located on the receptor cells are stimulated. They pick up the impulses in the food and quickly send that signal to the brain for interpretation and we will feel the taste of the food. The organ for smelling is the nose. Smell is referred to as olfaction and is a chemical sense as taste. Odorants enter the nose where olfactory receptor cells in nasal lining are responsible for the detection of these molecules. 
at the roof of our nasal cavity there are very tiny hairs called olfactory cilia that get stimulated after they pick up chemicals in the air going into our lungs as they pick up the signal they send it to the olfactory bulb from the olfactory bulb the information is carried to temporal lobe where smell is recognized and to the limbic system where emotional significance is associated unlike taste there are many different forms of smell the brain region for smell is closely connected with the brain regions involved with memory that is the limbic system that is why strong memories are made through the sense of smell the flavor of a food is conveyed by a combination of its smell and taste flavors are described by a complex set of references to substance that possess elements of these flavors for example wine experts talk about the nose of a wine meaning its smell the sensory receptors in the nose that pick up chemicals are called chemoreceptors these receptors get tired after constantly receiving signals of the same stimuli that is why if we stay in a smelly room for a long time it becomes normal until we go out and come back in the process of sensation and perception and all the related sensory processes can be clubbed under psychophysics it can be defined as Uh, the study of translating external physical stimuli to a psychological experience psychologists use another word called threshold to measure these psychological experiences it refers to the certain amount of energy that is necessary in order for us to sense our environment there are two types of thresholds they are absolute threshold and difference threshold now we'll see what is this absolute threshold absolute threshold refers to the smallest level of energy needed by an external stimulus to be detectable by the human senses including vision hearing taste smell and touch in a sound detention experiment the experimenter may present a sound with varying levels of volume the smallest level that a participant is able to hear is called as the absolute threshold what's this difference threshold it can be referred to as the minimum amount of the threshold energy which is needed to produce a noticeable change the greater the stimulus intensity the greater is the energy or change needed to produce a noticeable change the difference that one feels when hands are dipped in 0 degree water and then suddenly to a 50 degrees of water is very large but if the same individual dip his hands in a 40 degree hot water and then suddenly to a 50 degree hot water a difference is not that much noticeable so this is called as difference threshold to conclude we know that sensation and perception they are interrelated similarly all senses are also interrelated it is important to remember that the senses do not function independently thank you so much